Hello, my name is Deborah Henderson and I'm a principal user researcher with Xbox. I'm the studio lead for publishing and today I'm going to be talking about how user research helps support deep representation on Tell Me Why. If you're unfamiliar with Tell Me Why, it is a branching narrative game by Don't Nod and it features a transgender protagonist. While this is by no means a first within gaming, it is a first for Microsoft and quite frankly for me. Xbox Research has been around for 20 years now, and this is the first time our group has really been challenged to do this kind of work. Working on this game changed the way that I think about representation and the way that I think about user research, and that's what I'll be talking about today. However, before I begin, I would remiss if I didn't give a quick shout out to all of the lovely people who helped me do research on this game without their uh, wonderful efforts and support and thoughts and just sort of expertise, the game wouldn't be what it was when it finally shipped. When we're talking about representation, I think the first thing I need to talk about is what on earth do I mean by deep representation? As some of you may be aware, there is an effort within Xbox called Gaming for Everyone, or G4E, that is focused on increasing how inclusive Xbox as a platform is. And this is a wide-reaching effort, but one of the ways we help support this effort is that we have been on our external surveys uh, asking a question of players, just whenever they've played a game, just sort of asking, hey, have you seen or heard anything in this game that made you feel included or represented? And what's interesting about this is when we look across games, we start to see a couple of patterns for how representation can lead people to feel included. And generally speaking, there are sort of two different kinds of representation that we see. So I'm going to be talking about this by, as a binary. I do suspect it's probably actually a little bit more of a spectrum. But the two kinds of rep representation are surface representation and deep representation. The main distinction here is the degree to which the represented characteristics are integrated into the gameplay experience. So surface representation tends to sit on top of the gameplay, where, while deep representation tends to be strongly integrated into the gameplay or into the narrative. And just just into the experience all up. Both types of representation increase the feeling of inclusion, but the way that they increase that, the sense of inclusion differs. And similarly, the way players evaluate whether or not this representation is high quality also differs. Surface representation isn't in integrated at all into the game. So it will increase a sense of inclusion, typically by allowing players to express themselves in some way without actually altering the way that the game plays. So one example of this comes from Gears of War. Gears of War has a flag system. You can pick a flag that will show uh, behind your character. And with this, you can use sort of these flags to express yourself. It doesn't actually alter the way that the game plays. And when players look at these surface level systems, they typically evaluate whether this system is a good system, is a high quality system by looking at how equal the opportunity is that everybody has to express themselves. So based on your unique identity, can you come in and find something that says, yes, this is me. I would like to leverage this form of representation. This is who I want to be in this game. Um, as a result, breadth tends to be the important thing here, right? It's not about uh, whether or not everybody has a equal chance based on the probability that an, an individual be, will have a particular identity, but rather assuming an identity, do I have an equal chance to express myself or be represented? So. In this particular instance, uh, Gears actually went to Gleam, which is an internal group within Xbox uh, composed of LGBTQIA community members, and they had a chit chat about just sort of the breadth of identities contained within Pride. And so Gears doesn't just con include a Pride flag, it includes a huge range of flags so that everyone can actually express their individual identity. Success here is about breadth, particularly for surface level representation. I do want to add one caveat here. Uh, while I am talking about these things, um, representation in terms of things that are typically associated with demographics, so things like gender identity or race or age or things like this, um, identity is actually much broader than this. So a, another good example of a surface representation system comes out of Forza Horizon. They have a nickname system. They will call you by your first name. They will call you a silly name. You get to pick whatever name you want. This again is a great example of surface representation. It does not change the way the car handles as you're being called by a particular name, but um, it does sort of allow the player to build that kind of one-to-one -one connection between who they are and who they'd like to be in the game. 
Deep representation, by contrast, is something else entirely, because unlike surface representation, deep representation actually impacts the experience. So the characteristics um, that are being represented are somehow integrated into the gameplay, into the narrative, somehow it is fundamental to the experience. So a good example of deep representation is Pavarti from The Outer World. So Pavarti is asexual, and this is integral to her narrative arc in the game. You follow her um, as she kind of explores a relationship despite being asexual, and they sort of talk through the details of how that works, right? I don't know where it's leading yet, or if I'm misinterpreting. I'm not much interested in physical stuff. Never have been. Leastways, not like other folks seem to be. It's not that I can't, I just don't care for it. Looking at this, um, some people may look at, look at this character and say, oh, that's me, and form that connection. But for many with deep representation, the way that they feel included is they look at the respect with which this character is treated and think, if you are willing to treat this person who is atypical with this level of respect, then I believe that you will treat me with this level of respect, whatever my quirks and my sort of unicorn nature may be. Deep representation is really building an inclusive environment by modeling respect and modeling inclusion. So it's a little bit of a different uh, way for um, inclusion to be uh, generated, although both systems will definitely make more players feel included. I will say Tyler is an example from Tell Me Why, uh, an example of deep representation. When you are thinking about deep representation, you and your team are going to need to think through the impact this is going to have on the experience and on the player. So not only we talk about UR goals, they tend to be these kind of universal things. Everyone should have fun. The experience should be frictionless and understandable and approachable to everyone, right? Deep representation, however, is oftentimes a sort of more tailored experience. And teams need to sit down and think about what their goals are. Is your goal, for instance, to increase the breadth of representation and not be yelled at? That's one type of goal. Maybe your goal is to be a model of representation and say, this is how this person or this type of person should be represented. In that case, you might want to be lauded or complimented. But do you want to be complimented by game reviewers at large or by members of the represented community? Each of these are different audiences you need to think through. And some of what I'm going to talk to today is the approach that I use to try to make sure that we could encompass that breadth of audience, because there is a breadth of audience when you're talking about deep representation. Deep representation also tends to take an approach that isn't necessarily obvious to people at first. So within the US, there is a particular tendency to train people to be inclusive by being blind to identity. I'll be honest and say I sort of blame Martin Luther King for this, largely because of his quote where he says, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I think many games go after inclusion with this kind of mindset and with this sort of goal. So they will increase representation, but they will say within the game itself, we will judge you not based on how you present, but rather how you play the game. This is lovely. It's wonderful. It aligns to surface representation as a strategy. Deep representation, however, is not blind. It takes a multicultural perspective. And in multiculturalism, the argument is that group membership must not only be acknowledged, but also valued in order to, to attain equality and diversity. Here, too, I do think about some of the writing from MLK. But the writing I think of is from his letters from the Birmingham jail. In particular, there's a, there's a quote where he talks about those who prefer negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. In my opinion, deep representation is about that positive peace. It is about really sort of embracing what is different, highlighting that, and making sure that everyone can feel inclusive and inclusive towards those people who you are representing. Here we are celebrating differences rather than ignoring or erasing them. One of the outcomes of this, however, is that you need to think through with your team their tolerance for upset. Who are they willing to upset? Are they willing to upset anybody? I think it is unlikely that when you do deep representation particularly well that you're not going to 
end up upsetting anybody. I do think you're likely to sort of offend some people, in part because we're trained to be blind. We're not trained to see these kind of differences and celebrate and delight in them. This is a strange and different mindset for a lot of people, and it can be a little bit alienating. The other thing that we need to talk about here is how user research all up fits within the gaming publishing system. So I am super proud to be a user researcher, and there are so many things I delight in with my role. I love the fact that I am constantly challenged to make games more approachable, more accessible, and quite frankly, just more delightful for players. At the same time, I mentioned earlier that Tell Me Why was kind of a first for Microsoft in terms of representation. but. It's not a first within gaming, and there have been many beautiful games that feature trans protagonists and stories, but if I'm honest, I'm not really sure how many of those games have been, been, been supported by a user research team. Because of course, user research is expensive, and I'm part of a system. I am a form of investment that Microsoft makes in the games it publishes. And it's delightful to me that a top request from some of the new study studios that we acquired is to get access to UR. But it also reminds me that I need to think about how UR is used within this system. In particular, I think there is a risk sometimes that UR is going to be used, particularly around representation, as a mitigation system, as in a, oh, could you just put this in front of people of the following background and like make sure that it's okay we're doing this. You'll note, this is a negative peace model. And to be perfectly honest, as a researcher, I think it's kind of a perversion of our methods. I don't like working that way because I think it goes into a form of research and asks the data to turn out in a particular way. Like, I just need people to sign off that it's okay for me to do this. That's not how I'm willing to work. What I'm gonna talk through for the rest of the talk is the approach I took to try to avoid some of these pitfalls, and get to a place where I thought that I actually could be a constructive and helpful and facil sort of facilitator of this kind of deep representation. So the first step for me was I needed to get an education. So there is just a fundamental question when you are part of a system and someone assigns you a product to work on whether or not you're actually competent to work on this particular topic. This is going to be a challenge when you're dealing with deep representation, right? Um, this may not be an identity that you have a lot of experience with. You know, I certainly didn't. I came out of this with a lot of academic training. You know, I have a PhD in cognitive psychology. This means that I understood the difference between gender and sex. My background is also focused in psycholinguistics. This means that I have a deep understanding of the word performative. But that didn't mean that I had a really good understanding of the kind of moment-to-moment -moment experience of being transgender. I really couldn't speak to that. And I didn't necessarily think that I had the confidence to ask the right questions um, when I were to bring participants in. So the first step for me was to do a lot of reading. I tended to focus on biographical content just because I was really interested in understanding stories that were gonna be similar to the one that we were telling. But I will also mention that the book Unbound was really helpful for me because it really highlighted a lot of sort of the systemic bias within the medical system that really pushes people towards a binary notion of gender. I also watched documentaries and I read articles, and all of this education was not to make me an expert. I am still absolutely not an expert. But this education did help me with something. It helped me move to the next step, which was talking to others. I absolutely believe that you need to be talking to your team constantly about these sorts of things. I do not think that one person alone in a room with a pile of books is gonna get representation right. There are a couple of reasons for this. First, language is really hard. I still mess this up. I have a lot of training. I have a lot of wonderful people who have been correcting me when I get it wrong. And at the same time, if you ask me to describe my gender identity, I will still frequently describe myself as being cisgendered with the ED, which I know is wrong, and I only apply it to myself. But I still trip over this. Language requires practice to master. The other thing is that I think it's really important to build a culture of transparency about both what you're attempting to accomplish and where maybe you thought of some ideas that weren't so good. It's important to bring everyone along on this journey. Isolation is not gonna get you to success here. Part of why it's important to bring everyone along is that I fundamentally believe that embarrassment is probably kind of integral to this process. 
here's sort of a moment where I'm gonna say like the quiet part out loud, which is to say when we talk about representation, we're not typically talking about worries about, for instance, representing cisgendered, white, heteronormative, able-bodied men. Rather, we're talking about whether or not we can represent marginalized experiences, people who are somehow not normative or on the edge in some way. This action is logical, it is worthy, I believe in the power of representation, but it is by its nature atypical. It's going against the norms of what we do. And when I think about what embarrassment is, well, embarrassment is a form of pain that prevents people from behaving outside of social norms, which means as I go about working on representing marginalized perspectives, I should expect to be embarrassed because I'm going to have to violate some of the rules that I have been trained in by society over the years. Now, I don't think I can choose whether or not to be embarrassed. However, I do think I can choose how to handle my embarrassment. And for me, it was important to work through this, in part because in some ways this is sort of the only form of bravery I can show. And I do think it's important to have skin in the game um, when you're sort of dealing with identity because this is clearly high risk for some individuals. And the other thing is, when it came to a basic choice of, would I like to avoid embarrassment or would I like to perpetuate a harmful behavior? Gosh, I'd really rather I was embarrassed and got over it. I don't wanna hurt other people. And if pain has to come out of a situation, I'd rather inflict it towards myself. At the same time, I will say, I'm not super wild about being embarrassed. It's not pleasant and is really not my yen, which is part of why education was so important to me and part of why talking to my team was so key. I could build a group of people I could trust myself to be embarrassed in, from, in front of, and then I could learn from them and they could correct me and they could help me and I could work through it and I could be, become better and more knowledgeable. For me, I think representation has to be a journey, and you have to be willing to go on that journey in order to do it well. The other thing you're going to need to think about when it comes to embarrassment is not just your embarrassment, but the embarrassment of others. You are going to have to manage and accommodate some of this sometimes. I will give you a very specific example. This talk. In my original pitch for this talk, I was planning to do what I traditionally do in a user research talk, which is talk about our original idea, show some data demonstrating why this is a terrible idea, and then talk about how we changed things and hooray, heroically solved the problem. I'm not gonna do that in this talk, in part because when people look back on some of the things that we sort of thought, oh, maybe we could do that, most of us are really embarrassed by this. I'm really embarrassed by some of the things I was like, I don't know, that seems like maybe that'll work, let's try it. Right? And it's not that people don't own these mistakes, they do. And to be perfectly honest, a lot of these people didn't need UR to actually realize that what we were suggesting was a mistake. They knew that in advance. And I will say, it's not that the idea of uh, embarrassment is so strong that you need to shut down. That reaction is not necessarily universal. For some people, there was a belief that we should share mistakes because then other people could learn from them. At the same time, the embarrassment was very, very, very strong. And this fear of this was enough that Microsoft Publishing just asked me not to talk about anything that isn't in the final released build. For the record, I'm fine with this. It's not the choice I would have made, but I'm okay with it because I think it's really important to have empathy for those you disagree with. And embarrassment is awful, right? It's really terrible. And on top of that, the main lesson that I really want you all to take away from this is that you have to plan for embarrassment, expect it, don't let it surprise you, and then try to figure out a way to work around or through it. So the other thing that talking did, and talking was again, I cannot emphasize how important this was. We talked both internally within the publishing team, but we also talked a lot with Don't Nod when they had their original idea of what the game was gonna be. And what this really allowed us to do, and allowed me in particular to do, was suss out whether or not I actually felt comfortable backing this game. It is an awkward truth that there are kind of is a choice early on that a UR, particularly if you're a senior UR the way that I am, gets to make about a game where you get to decide, do I invest in this in order to manifest its success and really embrace the design vision? Or do I invest in this in a risk mitigation mode where really what I'm trying to do is reduce the sort of potential side effects that might come out of this product? Again, you'll note the negative positive piece difference there. I didn't know initially whether this game was a good idea. 
But what helped me was talking to Don't Nod. In particular, we had a process where the publishing team would come together, we would have an embarrassing conversation about what we were worried about, things like this. We'd make each other, other blush. We'd come together with a list of questions. We'd send them off to Don't Nod, and Don't Nod would generously and sort of beautifully answer our questions and really sort of helped assuage some of the fears that we have. In particular, they helped me in two ways. One was it became very clear very early through this process what that Don't Nod had a very clear intent for this game. They fundamentally believe that transgender people should be treated just like cisgender people. This is what they wanted to do in their game. They wanted their game to be a model of respectful treatment. So on the one hand, they really wanted Tyler to have a strong identity as a trans man, and they wanted to get all the details right. But they also didn't want to trap Tyler in a typical trans story. So they didn't want to treat him um, as though the only story you could have was tied to his trans identity. This felt sort of limiting as a way that trans people get trapped as opposed to a sort of more generous world or more generous realm of stories that cisgender people can be featured in. Um, so they didn't want to limit the story that he could have. You can see this, I think, relatively clearly in the final design. So first, we're extremely transparent about who Tyler is. He is out, he is proud. Um, and the second is that if you look at the plot in this game, it does take a real hard gander at one of the more typical trans narratives out there, mainly um, sort of trauma associated with uh, transitioning. And by the end of episode one, it just gives a hard no to that and says, that is not this story. This vision very early on, I think drove this outcome. And it was extremely helpful for me to know that this was the intent that we were working for, because then that was something that I could get behind and I could actually sort of support using user research. That being said, this wasn't sufficient for me. I will say, if there's one thing that right now strikes sort of fear in my bones when somebody says it around G-Fury, it's the opening statement of, well, they're very well-intended. Almost always, this means that somebody has done something completely terrible, and <laughs> we're going to have to fix it, right? Right. Intention is not sufficient. So for me, one of the things I wanted to know really, really early on, and to be clear, we're having these conversations when the story doesn't exist, when there are characters, when there's maybe a rough plot, nothing is in game, it's all on paper, we're just having conversations. But one of the questions that I ended up asking is, why included somebody who's trans? Like, it's great to want to support people who are transgender, and it's great to want to be inclusive, but why this story? Why trans? And the answer that I got back from Don't Nod that gave me peace was that this is a game about identity and how we form it. It's about who we think we are. It's about who our family thinks we are. It's about the pressures the world places on us and how we build our personal narratives, how we remember our previous selves, how we choose to move forward. When I heard this, it began to make sense to me from an experience level, not just an authorship level, right? I understood how being a transgender twin might give you a fair bit of expertise around forming identity and how that actually is a pretty good uh, background for a hero and a story about identity. This was enough for me. And what I'm going to say is I don't know if it would be enough for one of you, but I do hope that you actually take the time to ask the question because I would hope that your designers have thought this through. They should have thought this through. Doing representation just for representation's sake doesn't tend to go well in my experience. The third step after chatting with your team is to actually sit down and talk with a subject matter expert. Now, hopefully you have a wonderful and diverse team with lots of people who are strong allies and actually have experience with this. I know I certainly benefited from the strong allyship of the people in my team. That being said, I also really benefited by talking to GLAD. I really liked partnering and really integrating a subject matter expert into the UR process for a couple of reasons. So subject matter experts are a little bit different than people who just have lived experience. So subject matter experts aren't just simply leveraging their own experience. Rather, they have enough of an education they're actually able to see across the diversity of experiences for the people that they are representing. They are also quite frankly, less likely to get offended and have a remarkable grace when helping you navigate really awkward questions that you're asking them. Because of course, they have more practice seeing through your terrible language to understanding what you're actually trying to say, and they will help you with this. Additionally, they've signed up for this work. They know what they're getting into, and quite frankly, they should be paid for it. They were in our case. And I think part of 
of that is nice because it means that their own identities are somewhat less in play. And this was a big risk for me, is that I feel extremely uncomfortable leveraging the identities of other people if I'm doing it in a way that's gonna put them at risk. The other thing that I will say is because they have a sort of education and intellectual framework around these issues, they oftentimes talk a little bit more de like designers. So for me, one of the ways that I used the SMEs was both in vetting um, the stories before I put them in front of participants because it de-risked things for me, it um, meant that all of the sort of big problems were already taken um, care of, and the ones that were still in the story were ones that we couldn't agree. We weren't sure were these problems or were these not. But the other thing that I used them for is I brought them into debriefs at times, and I just sent them my uh, reports and said, um, do you have advice on how we solve these things? What was lovely about this is because of their expertise, they could essentially do what the designers on publishing do when we're talking in debriefs, which is they could provide that kind of uh, outside perspective that nonetheless has expertise on how to solve these sorts of problems. So they weren't trying to own the story, but they could go through and say, hey, here are, I think, the things that are leading people to this conclusion. Here are some moves you might consider making. And then Don't Nod could actually sit down and think about what they were trying to accomplish and how they wanted to get there. So I fundamentally recommend having a partnership with somebody like Glad. Nick Adams and Blair Durkee were both wonderful. I really, really appreciated working with them. The next step we did after we had vetted the story using um, these experts is we did start bringing in participants. And we did bring in two sets of participants. We brought in trans participants and we brought in um, just sort of typical branching narrative participants. So we did do a bunch of uh, research on this title. We did three narrative usabilities, one gameplay usability and accessibility usability, uh, three play tests, including one, uh, the last one that was at home because of COVID. Um, we also did a couple of reviews. What I will say is every single time we brought participants participants in, we were able to include at least some trans participants or members of the trans community. Um, however, the way that we did this and the way that we recruited sort of grew over time. Initially, the way that I recruited participants was by using internals to Microsoft. There were a couple of reasons for this. Um, first, I actually had a point of contact. I could sort of reach out to an alias um, and have a group of people who had identified in as part of this community and say, hey, would anybody like to come in? Um, I liked using Microsoft internals because I'll be honest and say, I did worry about the risk of just bringing someone in. I wanted to make sure that we had actually sort of, it was Microsoft's risk. I just thought it was better for Microsoft to shoulder that risk. It was also something where, because these people uh, oftentimes were working in the gaming industry, they had a better understanding of like how games are early in production. And I thought that would potentially insulate them if they were sort of worried about some of the things we were proposing. They would understand and have a better grasp of just how in flux things could be and why they shouldn't worry that this was something we were gonna ship with. Uh, this was, for me, a way to de-risk this. The next thing we ended up doing is actually snowballing some recruiting. This was incredibly helpful for me. So it turns out State of Decay uh, 2, it uses a system where it scans real people's faces. This is one of the ways it makes sure that it has representation and diversity. And it is actually a beautiful example of uh, surface representation that's about world building rather than about player identity. And as part of that, they had recruited a number of transgender participants and had scanned them and included them in the game. They uh, went through and double checked with each of them and then were able to put me in contact with these individuals. And what was lovely about this is because I was talking to individuals who were not a part of the gaming system, they could just email back and forth with me before they agreed to join a particular study. So they could ask a bunch of questions. And this was incredibly helpful. I started to know how to actually explain what we were trying to do to people. And I started to think through, like, what did I need to tell people before I recruited them or during, during the recruiting process so they would feel safe and comfortable coming in and agreeing? This uh, knowledge base was then sort of leveraged to turn into uh, a panel. And we ended up building a panel that we referred to as Quartz. This used an informed consent model. So when we were recruiting, and we typically were recruited through community groups and things like this, uh, we would send out a survey. In the survey, we would explain that we were why we were interested in having feedback from this uh, community. We also tended to give a more functional definition of gender. As I've mentioned a couple of times, language is tricky. Uh, language around transgender is particularly 
tricky. It's also weird to establish any sort of standard of who is trans and who's not. That's just creepy in a lot of ways. So the way we ended up saying this is we just said we were interested in hearing from individuals who both play games and have personal experience with the less commonly represented forms of gender identity and expression. We were looking for individuals who either do not identify or do not present as cisgender, individuals who have or will transition individuals who have close family members or loved ones who identify or present in one of these ways. This last part was actually due to part of the snowball recruiting. So one of the participants who wanted to come in was 17. And because they were 17, he was not able to sign an NDA. And so we told him he couldn't come in and he was really sad about this. And his father said, you know, can I come in and do this for him? And we said, well, sure. I mean, absolutely, you should come in and do this. And what was lovely about this data is it became very, 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 very clear that while allies are not necessarily representative of people who actually have lived experience, you can get close enough to somebody if you are their legitimate emotional support. So think spouse, so think parent, something very, 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 very close. These sort of people could come in and they had that same kind of expertise because in many ways they were living through it as well, although they themselves were not trans. Um, this was a very helpful way for us to sort of slightly broaden the audience because this is a very, very narrow audience to try to recruit for. Um, I will also say that the game <laughs> production went on long enough that we were later able to bring back um, the 17-year-old and were able to run them once they turned 18. So that had a happy ending there. As we were recruiting, we ex were explicit upfront about how we used gratuity, how we did gratuity. We made clear that when people joined the panel, um, they would be told what a, any any sort of gratuity that we're using for an individual um, study, they would be told that upfront. Um, and indeed, we also put a couple of boundaries on the data we would be collecting. So as an example, we agreed to never ask a question that we wouldn't ask a cisgender participant. So we didn't treat these participants in any way differently outside of the way that we recruited them. So as an example, when I was uh, sort of walking people back to the usability lab, I would tell folks that I knew they had been recruited this way, but they were under zero obligation to talk about anything that they didn't feel comfortable with and that I would be treating them on tape just exactly the way that I would treat any individual who would come in and, do, and was running in the study. Oftentimes people did volunteer things, and they were relatively open, but it was important to me that there be no expectation that anybody even need to comment about any form of gender representation just because they were transgender, and that was one of the reasons we had recruited them. Um, similarly, when we did playtesting, we didn't actually fork the survey at all, we just asked a standard set of questions. We did flex on a few things because finding transgender gamers is a little bit challenging. Um, so we tended to flex on things like they didn't actually need to have a specific interest in narrative games. Um, this was interesting because if you recruit somebody who's used to playing like an Assassin's Creed or a Halo and you drop them into a branching narrative game, they do tend to have some thoughts on pacing, which is unsurprising. Um, similarly, we told them that they had to feel comfortable like learning a controller, but they didn't need to master it. Part of this is because branching narrative games are pretty generous in terms of their controls, but part of this was also because um, it, it was preferable for us that we work with people to get them to be sort of comfortable in the study with the controller rather than that we sort of exclude them. So uh, there were a couple of things that we did with the mods where we just had mods help people um, pl while playing and like figure out how to use the controller. We did end up as a result having some um, more detailed and lovely feedback about uh, our onboarding systems. I think this was also like a delightful bonus as a result of this. Um, I will say both both of these flexes, I think, had overall very positive impacts outside of uh, getting feedback from the trans community. Um, we also did give our playtest moderators some explicit training on how to deal with any sort of problematic behavior that would be expressed towards these participants. And part of why we did that is because we tended to run participants, um, we never ran a study that was just trans participants. So we did also include uh, branching narrative players at all times. These were recruited in a standard manner, so we didn't ever inquire about their gender. Um, some of them turned out to be transgender. Some of them turned out to have close family members with that. That, however, was relatively infrequent. Um, and I think if we hadn't been deliberately building the quartz panel, we wouldn't have been successful at um, hitting the sort of diversity numbers that we were looking for in our recruiting. We did notice some differences in the way that participants' groups tended to respond. So 
citizen trans participants tended to um, see the same problems very differently. And it wasn't really a matter of understanding. They had all the same facts. They agreed that they had all the same facts, but they just put them together a little bit differently. And this tended to be due to their sort of lived experience. So a good example of this is the Sam confrontation when the twins first go home and Sam um, ends up confronting them. He is drunk and he questions who Tyler is and he happens to have a shotgun. And this was something where this confrontation was planned relatively early on. So the first time we tested this was actually in a narrative usability. And even from there, we started to see differences between our trans and our um, cis participants. So cis participants tended to righteously confront Sam and stand up for Tyler and on his behalf and tell Sam all the ways in which he's wrong. He really liked telling him he was just completely wrong. He shouldn't be behaving that way. Trans participants were more likely to wonder if they could get out of the scene without being shot. Seems we got a trespasser. Uh, what the fuck? You got five seconds to talk me into defending my property. Your property? Five. Four. I'm Tyler. Don't know any Tylers. Three. Two. Sam! Ellie? What are you doing out here, girl? This is our house. Was I talking to you? Sam, put the gun down. This is Tyler. My brother. Well, your brother? Oh, shit. Huh. I guess I heard about all that, but I never... <laughs> Damn, <laughs> you look like a real man. So do you, Sam. You know what I mean. I just didn't know they could make a woman look so much like a man. You know, I'm just trying to be me. It's just who I am. Hmm. Well, I've seen a couple of lady transvestites on the TV before, but, uh... Uh, I've never seen it, dude. Sam, that's not how you say that. Say what? Transvestites? Yes. It's transgender. Transgender men. Ugh. I'm sorry. It's hard to keep track out here in Delos Crossing. <laughs> the world's just moving on without us. It's fine. Let's just change the subject. <laughs> Works for me. Tyler. Thanks, Sam. This is important to recognize, right? Like, how we assess danger is not simply in the moment in the game. It is also all of our history that comes with us, right? This is important to think about and to sort of ponder. And when we looked at this scene, we didn't want to get rid of it. There were a number of reasons for that. But we did do a lot of things to try to de-risk this situation for transgender participants. So if you look at the positioning of the shotgun in the scene when it's playing and things like that, there are ways we try to make Sam sort of immediately de-escalate rather than overtly escalating. The other way that this is a little bit different is that oftentimes in branching narrative games, um, there's a large focus on whether or not you've changed the plot. This is an instance where we refused to allow players to change the plot. And Donut did this because they thought Sam should change and they didn't want people to feel like they had done it wrong, that they had somehow picked the wrong option to influence Sam. Instead, what changes in the game is the way that Sam interacts with you and it reflects the way that you interacted with him. So this is a good example of just like two different perspectives coming together to see the same thing in a very, very, very different way. The other thing that I would say is that a lot of my concerns initially were on behalf of trans participants, right? I really, I'll be perfectly honest, had a deep worry where I just wondered, oh no, what are we going to do to these poor people? Not that anybody had bad intentions, but I was just profoundly worried that our execution was going to be upsetting in some way. But as we went through this process, it became increasingly clear that I was thinking about this the wrong way. Trans participants weren't the vulnerable participants in this situation, in part because I think GLAD helped us a lot with that. But also, I would say, trans participants became our core. They became our experts. I started moving out 
of this sort of model where I was thinking of them as people we were going to harm. And I started thinking about them as the people who were the most skilled to engage with our game, right? And part of why I came to this conclusion actually came from a cisgender participant. There was, of all the people that I ran, only one person who had never heard of transgender people and didn't think they existed, quote, outside of fiction. It turns out that if you don't think that transgender people exist, it's extremely difficult to follow what's going on in this narrative. And the failure here was catastrophic. I'm not going to get into the details of how exactly they came to their conclusion, but I will tell you that instead of ever correcting and believing that Tyler was transgender, they somehow had a theory of essentially necromancers and a cult and mind control, and it got very complicated. I will say this is the one population I really wish I'd figured out how to recruit more of. I still don't know how to recruit for a lack of knowledge. If anybody solves this, please email me. But it was important for me to see this person because they really highlighted the full range of experience. And once I started realizing that there was a really a large range of understanding within our cis participants and within our trans participants, um, I started seeing it kind of everywhere. There was one particular problem that really persisted, though. And this one sort of surprised me. It was quite difficult to convince some people that Tyler was transgender, or they would accept that sort of in theory, but then not really actually think through what that meant. As an example, we ran a narrative usability um, early on um, with a version of the game that was essentially identical to what we shipped with. So participants came in, they understood that there was a flashback with Allison and her twin, who was somewhat femme presenting. They were then moved to um, adult Allison picking up her twin, Tyler, who announces, I am a trans man. Frequently, participants would spontaneously comment about how that was awesome and they love this kind of inclusive representation. But when I asked them to connect the flashback to the present day, they would stop, they would think about it, and come to the conclusion there must be triplets. They could not actually put it together, at least not initially. And typically, they got it, but it took a couple of reps. And this is, by the way, part of why marketing told everybody that Tyler was transgender. I was an advocate for this because I didn't think that um, we could be subtle about this, right? It is also why Tyler has so many clues um, in his sort of initial room that you're exploring when you're meeting him for the first time about being transgender and about being out. You know, at times we would get feedback from some of our trans participants suggesting like that like the details were a little on the nose. A good example of this is the calendar, right? In the calendar, it, he writes testosterone on it multiple times. Um, and we got comments from players being like, I mean, yeah, sure, I kept a calendar, but like I don't need to be told it's testosterone. I know what I'm taking. However, that's not there for trans participants. That's actually there for the cisgender participants to just sort of help them onboard and think through what's happening here and what this means for Tyler, right? I will say, um, when we tested, uh, play tested the game in essentially its released form, there are still some players who don't really figure out what's going on with Tyler or can't really like lock in on a sense of what's happening until they reach that Sam confrontation. And I think that confrontation is helpful for people, both because Sam kind of embodies the struggle that the participant may be going through, but also, unfortunately, it really is a kind of stereotypical moment. It's a very recognizable moment for people where they say, oh, right, that person's transgender. People are mean and weird to them about it. It became meaningful and grounded in those mo moments for those players. That is an unpleasant thing to think about. It is also why representation matters, right? And for me, it was important to make sure we didn't lose people along the way, particularly when these were people who were getting lost, not because they had any sort of bias, but because they just simply lacked understanding. I will say across all of our sort of audience interactions, I do think there are certain patterns that I, will, that I can call out here. So the um, subject matter experts, and this included um, both GLAD, but also when we were working with Checkpoint and things like this, were really great for providing history and for providing context. And they would talk about, you know, GLAD would talk about things in terms of the Hayes Code, where participants would talk about things in terms of tropes, right? Players with lived experience tended to think about detail. They were really good about saying, yes, this is a true detail. No, this is not a true 
detail. This was super valuable. And I'll be honest and say, in certain instances, it was a very clear source of inspiration. Um, at one point, this wasn't user research, but uh, the Gleam uh, group came and played through the game. And somebody pointed out that um, it would be really neat if Tyler, when he was a child, were to pick a name, because this is a very common experience that they had themselves experienced. And that's part of why Tyler has a nickname. And you see it throughout sort of the flashbacks, because this is Tyler beginning to assert himself. Ollie's Diary. It's been a long time since I heard that name. Was I the only one who ever called you that? Actually, no. I used it at Fireweed for a while, until I settled on Tyler. Most people were pretty chill about the switch. Not everyone, though. So there's one other method that I want to throw out um, to... Your, for your consideration in terms of uh, something that you might be able to apply to your own work. I will say this is one of the, the few things that I'm actually reapplying very, very swiftly, which is we did a check on the dialogue. So this is based on an um, analysis that uh, a team did looking at Disney films and looking at um, who gets to talk in movies, right? And for a while, there was a sort of big sort of congratulations for Disney's because they were moving um, to the princess films where they were really centering the story around a female character. But when you're actually look at who talks in those movies, it's not women, right? The balance is really, really off, in part because they have fewer number of lines or because the lines that they have are just less interesting. They got to say, oh, yes, and, you know, sort of agree to things. Um, so what we did is we um, basically mimicked this um, analysis where we um, got the audio director, did me a huge favor, and turns out was able to export the entire script into an Excel. I had no idea before this product that that was possible, but it is. And once it is, I knew the line and I knew the character who was saying the line. It was relatively tri trivial for me to add up both the number of lines and the number of words that each character got to say. And then we could look at that across sort of demographic splits within the characters, right? If we were looking at age, if we were looking at gender, if we were looking at race, was the distribution of lines consistent with uh, the baseline that we would have expected to see. So, for instance, was there a 50-50 split when it came to gender? Turns out we weren't perfectly um, great at this the first time around. We did make some changes. I can't tell you specifically what you are. But I really love this analysis in part because it really forced us to think through a couple of things. First of all, we actually had to think through what our base rates are. We ended up going not with Alaska, which is where um, Tell Me Why is set, but rather with sort of the U.S. all up because we thought that was more representative of our audience. And we thought about representation, we thought, hey, I'm not sure accuracy of Alaska is the important thing here, rather than making sure that we are producing a game where people have a chance to see themselves in it, right? That that was the option that people made there. Um, the other thing that I will say is I love this analysis because it's quick, it's easy, and I think it's a great UR um, analysis to hold ourselves accountable, right? Because this really is about how we make games, right? This may not seem like a UR thing, but I think it is for a few reasons. First of all, it's about math, and we do love math. That is kind of our jam. Um, I'm not sure anybody else gets excited about checking base rates. Um, and the second thing is, it's data that will then drive an awkward conversation. And this also is our area of expertise. We have lots of terrible conversations with people based on data turning out to be like, whoops, not quite how we want it. The third thing that I'm going to say is that I actually think it's also a good thing for you are to think about because I think it matters to the experience. And in particular, I think it matters to the experience if you are casting um, in such a way that the character and the actor have alignment in terms of who they are, right? So in our case, we um, cast a trans man who was amazing um, to play Tyler. This was very important. He was able to provide, um, August Black was able to provide a lot of sort of notes in terms of making sure the lines felt natural and felt good and really sort of worked and provide that kind of level of polish. That is one way that casting improves um, an experience. But in this particular case, I think it's also important to notice the fact that we also included uh, trans actors when it came to localization. And I'm not really convinced that they got to have the same influence over the story. I kind of suspect they didn't because it was pretty locked by the time it moved to localization. That being said, I can tell you based on uh, player reaction that this matters. It matters to the experience. It changes your perception of the experience to know that 
the people who are being paid by this game, the way the game is made, it is also representative. And this is another form of representation we need to think about. In the same way that we're having hard conversations about crunch and what that means for experience, I think it's worthwhile for you to have hard conversations with your team about representation of the people um, who you're hiring. So with all of these methods and all of these audiences, I think there is sort of a question of like, do we feel successful? Was this game successful? And I don't really know how to answer that question. There's so many ways to think about this. On the one hand, I can definitely point you to reviews from the community, reviews that make us so proud because they saw what we were trying to do and they told us we were doing it well. And I, I cannot talk um, sort of about the importance that that was for the team. That was so important for them to see. I will also say it was also really useful for us to see some of the criticism coming out of the community because people were engaging deeply in this. And even if we didn't necessarily agree, it was so wonderful to see that conversation. I will also tell you that the audience that Tell Me Why draws is in fact more open to LGBTQIA individuals. Um, not because they themselves necessarily share that identity, but because when we measure them on metrics of uh, sort of inclusion or openness to individuals, um, they score higher than other games that we've released um, and other sort of samples of Xbox Live, essentially. So the way that we measure this, and I'm going to give you all the questions here, um, Glad gave us a set of questions. We altered these so that they would work for gaming. Um, I will tell you a couple of things about applying these. I do think that these smaller component questions are really important. They have a lot more variability and I think are a lot more diagnostic. Sometimes you can see like basically no difference in some of the high level scores. But at the same time, if you look at some of the lower level scores, you say, oh, no, 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 people are moving around at this and you see population differences there. Um, for the record, you are welcome to use our wording if you would like to. I can't give you the exact numbers that we came out of with this just because I think that that's a product of the pipeline along with these questions. That being said, if you can set yourself up a pipeline, I, I can tell you that these are diagnostic. Um, the other thing I will say is that I do find it pretty useful to bin um, by uh, demographic stats here. So as a general pattern, I will say women tended to be uh, more open uh, to LGBTQIA inclusion um, across all of our games. And similarly, um, I look a fair bit at uh, gender uh, sort of bins. And in particular, I'm using um, like Gen Zs versus Millennials versus um, Gen X, that kind of thing. Part of why I'm binning by generation is that although there's a lot of rhetoric out there about Gen Z being more inclusive or welcoming, or just sort of not thinking about gender in the same way, uh, I will say that I don't necessarily see that reflected in the scores. More typically, I see millennials um, in my samples being more inclusive um, when measured by these questions. I can also tell you, by the way, that I think this is a game that can work for people who are coming at it from a very different perspective than the trans community, right? And for me, this was really, really important. I think approachability matters on these topics. Um, it is one of those things where I have immense pride when I see um, reviews of people who basically say, I didn't think that um, I was going to be into this because I'm not really a supporter of the LGBTQIA community, but I really liked the game. I think this is important for me because I think this is how representation works, right? You know, the, there is the fundamental idea that there's nothing more powerful than a person coming out. And yet at the same time, there's extreme risk involved when people do that. Tyler has the advantage of being fictional. And if he is the first transgender person that somebody interacts with, yes, let's have that be a good experience for them. And let's have them understand and get a realistic per sort of perspective of how to interact with somebody who is transgender. These are things that I um, think are wins coming out of this, ga this game, though I'll be honest and say, I don't actually know uh, how broad spread that is. I don't have a really good metric there. I will also tell you that one win I personally have is that I really now have a different way to think about representation. And this for me actually becomes clearest when I'm talking about this title within Microsoft and people are trying to be nice to me. They oftentimes pay me a compliment that I find sort of uncomfortable now. And I know they mean well, I hear it that way, I appreciate the compliment, but it still kind of skeeves me out. Um, and essentially the compliment reminds me a lot of a quote from Frost, right? When he talks in his poem about two roads diverged in a wood and I took the one less traveled. And that has made all the difference.
This characterization of like two paths and you take the one that is less popular and isn't that heroic tends to be how I worry people are seeing me. I don't think about this experience this way, right? I don't think that this was a simplistic choice. I don't think it was a matter of picking a path and going through it. I think it was a matter of beating your way through the jungle in the hopes you would end up somewhere non-disastrous. I'm really proud of where we ended up. I understand, like, looking from the outside, it could be hard to see the difficulty we had getting there. But for me, there's a pride in persistence, right? And when I think about the strategy that we used, it's not around trying to separate ourselves from others or sort of trying to not be that. Rather, I think about the strategy in terms of just being the change you want to see in the world. You know, Don't Not had a very explicit vision and a very explicit goal they wanted to achieve and embody. And I think that they were able to do that. I hope that they were able to do that. I believe that you are helped them on the path to doing that. And to be honest, that's kind of what we're good at. We're really good at supporting a design vision. So I hope within your own field, within your own span of control, you can find a vision around deep representation that you think is worth supporting. And don't let anyone's embarrassment, yours or other people's, stop you from figuring out the right thing to do. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I wish you the best of luck through this problem. I hope you have strong allies and advocates within your team. It is a hard problem. It is one that is fraught with so much tension and so much difficulty and so much uncertainty, but I absolutely believe it is worth the effort. Thank you so much.